Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Hot Topic webinar. My name is Matthew Darius. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator here at ASBO, and I'll be moderating today's call. Uh, before we get over to today's content, just have a few things to let you know. If you have questions at any time during the webinar, please feel free to ask them. There's a couple ways you can do that. Uh, if you're comfortable using the chat screen, which is on your GoToWebinar control panel, which is typically on the right-hand side of your screen, go, feel free to type uh, your question right in the chat, and we'll get that answered for you. Or there's also a question and answer screen, which is our preferred method of asking questions today. Type your question in there, uh, and then I can queue those up to be answered by our presenters. Uh, now we have Deborah Cunningham, our Director of Education Research, to introduce today's speakers. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Deborah Cunningham, Director of Education and Research for the New York State Association of School Business Officials. Our topic today is the New York State Student Information Repository System for School Business Administrators. And it concerns enrollment reporting for state aid, including student eligibility for free and reduced price lunch programs and other demographic and program service data that school districts submit through their regional information centers to the state education department. Why is this important? Uh, a number of these uh, data elements are critical for state aid. They are also used for school accountability purposes and for local financial management and long-term planning, uh, not to mention um, some of the information being used for uh, modeling of, of state formulas through the budget process. I think our members have realized um, that this, the quality of these data is really important. We know it depends on good professional development experiences where you get to talk about some of the issues in the data reporting and also quality written procedures. So we hope to bring both of those to you today. Uh, our presenters um, come from the Central New York Regional Information Center. Uh, Angie Russell is District Data Coordinator, and she's certified as both a school district business leader and a school district leader. She spent five years as a special education coordinator and the last five years as a data administrator. Uh, she uh, participates in monthly meetings with the State Education Department on the SERS Data Warehouse and subsequently leads both state, regional, and district data trainings. Tina Boots, also district data coordinator for the Central New York RIC, is a certified school business administrator. Uh, she's worked in school business offices for 12 years, including four as an administrator. She's presented on the, on the new free and reduced price lunch reporting for the student information repository system and supports data verification in four area school districts. Now, um, by these, um, Angie Russell and Tina Booth will do the presentation, but we have also asked that Bruce Jozielowski from the State Aid Unit uh, be involved in this webinar because we know there may be questions uh, related to State Aid that you may have. So we've asked Bruce to join. He's going to be listening in and prepared to answer questions you have that uh, fall in the area of State Aid specifically. Bruce is an associate in school business management at the New York State Education Department in the State Aid Office. He's one of those rocks of this, the State Education Department that if he were to leave, the place would collapse. He started uh, at State Ed in 1989 working in the Program Services Reimbursement Unit on rate setting and other fiscal matters for private and public school approved special education programs. Then uh, since 2002, he's been in the state aid office. His duties have included supervising attendance and transportation program areas and coordinating the calculation of New York City building aid. Since June 2012, Bruce has been supervising the state aid data unit. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Angie Russell and Tina Boots for our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Good afternoon, everyone. As you can see, we have sort of a format that we're sort of going to try to stick to. However, it is very fluid. If you wish to ask a question somewhere throughout, where we have no problem with that, but we are going to try to leave at least 10 minutes at the end for any additional thoughts you may have. 
Today, obviously, we're showing you a PowerPoint and then a question, question and answer time slot. We have 40 minutes for the SIRS, 10 for three enrollment summary, and roughly 10 minutes for a question and answer. And we're OK with deviating from that, just a guide. As part of the presentation overview, we've sort of broken it up into eight parts. Because while they're all intertwined, they all have their separate details that need to be followed. Part one, we're going to talk about what SIRS means. Part two is the staff template collection and reporting, which has in, sort of taken over the business offices. Part three are other templates that we report. Part four is bed day enrollment for state aid purposes. Part five is specifically free and reduced lunch. Part six is three year enrollment summary. Part seven is the timeline for reporting. And last but not least is our part eight with question and answer. So what is SIRS? Most of us outside the, the data warehouse portion of SED and the regional information centers, it's just another acronym. But the purpose of SIRS is to collect a large amount of data and provide a single source of standard individualized student records for analysis at both the local, regional, and state levels. Obviously, a lot of the reason for this is to improve student performance. It's also used to make state and federal reporting and accountability requirements. And of course, fiscal decision making and future planning is the, another consideration that all this data is now being pulled in and used for. We currently use what we call a SIRS manual. And it's roughly, I think right now, 268 pages. And it sort of reads like stereo instructions, but nonetheless, it is our Bible and what we follow for rules and regulations and policy for the Student Information Repository system. This is if you decide to open up the SIRS manual, you will see this data flow. Clearly, this is a lot of detail. So we decided to break it down just a little bit so that it's a little bit more easy to understand. When we talk about how data flows through SIRS, we have a bunch of systems that we pull from. Namely, our student management system, we have a special education system, we have a human resource system, and then we have a food service package. And we pull what we call extracts from each one of these systems, and they're loaded into level zero. These systems can vary across the state, and depending on which one you use, obviously you would need to know that, but there are, there are several you can choose from. When you load level zero, we're sort of just giving you a picture here of what level zero looks like. And that data is extracted out, loaded into level zero. And these fil fields that you see in front of you, and I just selected the demographics tab for your viewing, they will be filled in. Level zero then runs different data checks to make sure the data is sort of accurate in a sense. They run different checks against the policies that are created. Once that data is clean and there's no errors, the data moves up to level one, which is your regional information center. Your, each regional information center creates a set of reports that districts can use to verify their data, to make sure that it's at level one, to review all the sorts of student assessment data. There's a number of items. Now, depending on your RIC, your data at level one, may, your folders here may look different which is absolutely OK, because RICs are allowed to create whatever reports they find necessary. Once the data makes it to level one, we create yet another set of extracts that then move up to level two. And level two is where we find the PD system, if you're in special ed, the New York State portal, the business portal, or Cognos level two reports. And in Cognos level two reports, we're going to take today focus on just the beds and the staff folder. Clearly, you see there's a number of other folders there. And probably someone in your district is reviewing the data within each one of these folders. You have to have a certain access that's provided in SETOS to actually get to these folders. However, today, we're really just going to focus on the ones that impact the business office the most, which are the beds and the staff folder. Once that data is then reviewed in its entirety, the State Education Department uses it for the New York State report cards and also additional federal reports that are provided to the federal government.
So as we are looking at the staff template, so, so we're looking at feds and staff. Staff was listed twice, but that's the first one we're going to look at. And so in the past, certified professionals in the district have filled out bubble forms. And those bubble forms are now going away. They were used for the employee master, personnel master files that for bed day that the state takes, compiles, and uses for the report cards for the different districts in the state. And so the green bubble sheets for the teachers were actually replaced last year with an online access for the teachers to report that information. In addition, this year for 15-16, the pink bubble sheets for the non-teaching professional staff have been done away with. And so we're reporting now through the HR package, depending on your data source per district, most are using the HR system. We're reporting the staff information that was collected through the BEDS bubble forms, green or pink, and we're reporting them through data warehouse. And then there is a reviewing of those level two reports. And so to emphasize, the bubble sheets are no longer. All the teachers were switched last year, 14-15 school year, and the pink bubble forms for the non-teaching professionals are being reported through Data Warehouse this year starting. So we look at the staff templates and we see that there are five reportings at the SERS level. So if you were to drill into the staff folder that we saw on the previous slide, you would see these different reports listed in that level. So we have the SERS 320, which is your staff snapshot. Staff snapshot is all of your teaching and non-teaching professional staff that are reported there. The staff assignment is for the non-teaching professionals. Examples would be counselors, psychologists, business officials would be in there as well. Staff tenure is the SERS 322, and that lists the tenure status and effective dates or probationary end dates for the certified members that are tenure tracked in the district. The staff attendance is new for the 15-16 school year, and we will start reporting that, or we will be reporting it at the end of the school year. So that'll be something we're focusing on in May and June to be able to report. And then there's staff evaluation. The staff evaluation is for the APPR staff members, and that's where we report the, the, sec the different sections of the APPR plan, the 20, 20, and the 60, and then the total score. Depending on your district, if you receive the waiver, you would still be doing the 202060. Or if you're implementing the new that the governor put in place, you would be doing the 5050. And that's district specific as to whether you receive the waiver or not. On the next slide, we'll be showing the reports. And then, so each report has a summary table, and then they have a drill in. So we have the SERS 320. This is a staff snapshot, and this includes a breakdown of the buildings depending on your district, how many buildings you have, you would have multiple locations listed, and then a district total. And so each of these underlying numbers you could drill in. If you click on them, you would drill in, and you get the detail screen. Now this is very small in order to fit it on the page. Um, each of these fields is in the staff snapshot template and we need to, some are optional, some we have to report on. And so based on your district decision for the optional items, but this would be the detail of what we're reporting through Data Warehouse for the staff snapshot. We have the staff assignment, which is for the district. These are the non-teaching professionals. And again, we have the detail for the district and the different titles, if you see the assignment description, so on the back of your pink bubble forms, you use the list an assignment code. That would be where we're reporting it here in the staff assignment and where it's, it's collected at the state level. We have, oops. and just to be clear, all staff, and when I say all staff, let me let me rephrase that. When we have both the teachers and the non-teaching professional staff, all of those people need to be in the staff snapshot. Then in addition to that, those non-teaching professional staff then also end up in the staff assignment. So 
just to be very clear about the expectations of both of those extracts, um, because there has been some confusion that people have misconstrued that only teachers need to go into staff snapshot, and, and that's not the case. It should be teachers and then non-teaching professional staff as well. And if we have some questions about who's included in that, that grouping, please feel free to ask. So we have SERS 322, which is the staff tenure. And so again, we have the summary table. And again, we would be able to drill in. We have the list of teacher or administrative. And we would be able to drill into those details to see who's listed behind the fact. And you could use that to verify that everyone you think you're reporting is actually going to the state and being reported. And so here is the detail where you would have the location name and the educator's name, their teach ID, and the different information that's reported on the staff tenure this, for this school year. And then we have the staff evaluation. Um, like I said before, this is something that co we concentrate on in the September-October time frame after the APPR scores come down from the state, the growth scores and the district has compiled their evaluation information in the, the different uh, levels, the 60, the 20, and the 20. And then we, you could drill into this, this district in the 107 to see the detail and confirm that what's reported for each of the teachers is correct. So there's, there's a lot of information here, and when we drill in, you can see particular teacher broken out by the components, and you would be able to verify that the reporting for each of the teachers is correct to the state. Then we have the other templates that affect us. So as I just mentioned, she kind of went through the staff folder and within that folder the templates that we have to are required to report and the reports that show the output. So now we have other templates and we call them templates because we have a company, or I shouldn't say we, the state has a company called eScholar that they contract with to use their template setup. So when you see the required fields listed, we use the templates and New York State decides, okay, we want to f use these required fields. And an additional extracts or templates that we load are demographics, enrol enrollment, and program service records. Now, to be fair, there's roughly, I think, 22 extracts that we load. However, just for business office purposes and the data that business officials care about, we're including those here. So we care about demographics, which include the student's basic data, student ID, student name, grade, birth date, gender, ethnicity, if they're migrant, if they're homeless, and it also includes parent contact information. Please make note that we load this data all year long, and we have an August deadline when, when Data Warehouse closes. That doesn't mean you should wait till August to review this data. Hopefully you have processes in place where you're reviewing this data on somewhat of a maybe a monthly basis. And I'm hoping someone there in the districts has an idea of when deadlines come and go so the district can be proactive in their reporting. Another template that is applicable to the business official world is enrollment. And obviously when a student enters and or leaves the school district and or changes program, there could be enrollment changes that will impact those numbers you're going to see later in the presentation in something from, that you're familiar with called the three-year enrollment summary. Next, the template is program service records. Program service records are really facts about students. They have a beginning and an end date. And to give you an example of what a program fact would be is your UPK students. We report UPK program service records for them. Free and reduced lunch eligibility. So when you receive that free reduced lunch application, there are codes that are added to these students' records so that those codes are then extracted and pulled through data warehouse, level zero, level one, level two, and on up the chain so that we can see them in different reports. LEP students, your limited English proficient students, students with disabilities, NCLB, we collect program service records for them. 
Liberty Partnership, PTEC. We didn't list them all, obviously, but we tried to pick the ones that might be might impact the business official world. So why does enrollment why does demographic enrollment and program service data matter? And I said a lot of things, but this is why it matters. Many state aid calculations incorporate one or more of the BEDS enrollment items. And I, we've listed here the state aid handbook if you want to become more familiar or have questions. But the bottom line is that BEDS Day is the first Wednesday in October, which this, one, this year it was 10-7. And the reason BEDS Day is used is because hopefully returning and new student registrations have been processed and hopefully there's more stable enrollment counts. Students are counted in the district and the school where they are enrolled on BEDS Day. So if they left after 10, 8, or 10, if they left on 10, 8, they're going to be counted in the district they were on in 10, on 10, 7. Hopefully BEDS Day provides a point in time when student enrollments can be complete, unduplicated, and comparable. And in order to get to that point, you really have to have a review process in place so that someone is looking at was the student actually attending the school or was he attending somewhere else as of bed day. We have a way to review where these students were. Actually, we have several reports that hopefully someone in the school district is looking at. We have reports at what we call L2RPT, which is level two. The reports are designed to help districts verify enrollment and program service data, and they're usually available in October when data warehouse opens. So we have six different reports. We have the SERS 312, which is the Beds Day Enrollment for Verification for State Aid. We have the SERS 313, which is the location of enrollment and student subgroup. SERS 314 is all students by district of residence. SERS 316, which is the verification report for our pre-K students. SERS 319, which is actually not a certifiable report, but more of an informational report. It shows students enrolled in other public schools and charter schools. And last but not least, we have a SERS 323, which is your free and reduced lunch report, which shows the student's count of who is reporting as of bed today. So there are a number of different reports that you can use at your fingertips to look at, oh my goodness, this is the student number I'm reporting. Does it make sense? And for these enrollment reports, again, we're going to show each of them has a table of summary, so at a quick glance you can see the number of students that are reporting for each of these. And then you can drill into any of the numbers in order to see the detailed student listing of those. And so we have the 312, which is for state aid calculations. And based on your district demographics, you may or may not have any students in each of these columns. The most common for districts across the state would be in the GED, which is column B or C. If you have a district-approved program, you'd be in column B, or both these, if you subcontract, it would be your C column. Uh, column A, if you have a jail within your district boundaries and you are reporting incarcerated youth, those students would show up in column A. As Tina just mentioned, GED students show up in column B and C. We have column D, which are students enrolled full-time in other public school districts. Column E are your both these students, and this is a very common column for districts to have. I think nearly every district sends students to both these. The column F is students with disabilities in the special act district. So if you have someone in Rome or Batavia or some other special act placement, the student would be there. If students with disabilities in Batavia and Deaf is column G, H, resident students unable to be present in school. So these are your homebound students, not homeschooled. These are homebound due to medical reasons. And district policy will tell you what the, what the proof of that is. Uh, column I, is your uh, students who are attending your district that are not your residents. So they don't live within your district boundaries, but they're students that are attending your building. And that, depending on your district, would be uh, students who could be charged tuition, but they don't necessarily have to be charged tuition based on your board policy and any contracts that you may have 
would be determining, but they could be charged tuition, don't have to be charged tuition. And then we have for those districts, many times you will find these students are your, if your teachers bring their students to, to your district to attend and they live in a neighboring district. So a majority of the time that's who you will find in this column unless there are some other situations that you may have um, where students are living in another um, district but attending yours. Homeless is also another option. Column J, for those districts that border the state borders, so Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut, if you have staff members that are bringing their students and they live in a neighboring state, they would be listed in column J. And column K is based in Rochester. This is for the urban suburban transfer program and they're specifically that column specific to Rochester City School District. And then we have the detail screen. And so this would be some basic demographics of the students um, that you would be able to see and you'd be able to back up the number in that particular column so that you can again verify. And this particular screen is we showed you column E. So when we drilled in to look at those BOCES students, you can see obviously the student ID and name has been removed, but the beds location, you can see that it's TSD BOCES or KU Ganadaga BOCES. You can see which BOCES they're attending, their district of residence, so where do they live, and grade, gender, ethnicity, and so forth. So you can very clearly identify who is being reported as a BOCE student. The next report is your SIRS 313, and these, for the most part, are your students, any students attending your in-district building. So the district, the, the buildings that are within your district boundaries, that you are, you have your teachers and the like. And so, regardless of where they're living, these are the students educated. And so again, you have the, all students across the top and it's broken out by the grade level so you can drill into those. You also have the ungraded secondary and the ungraded elementary so you can see those student populations as well. And then going down the, the column on the left hand side of the screen, you have the different demographic breakouts of these students. So you have your male and your female breakouts, your ethnicity breakouts, the students with disabilities. So, this reporting is the vast majority of where your full-time equivalents are taken for state aid calculations and state aid formulas. And you can take the detailed students and give to like your special ed director and say, are these the students that we should be reporting and make sure that the list is all inclusive. And so there's people within the district, you're going to have a homeless liaison. If you have homeless students, they would be here. You'd have a migrant liaison. So they can verify these individual student demographics and subgroups to confirm. And in addition, this, these subgroups could be used for accountability purposes. That's on the instructional side, um, but you should be aware of it because it does report on the school report card. And so then we have the drill-in. So this would be the detail, like the 312, it gives the information on the particular students. We've taken out the information that would be personally identifiable, but again, you have the different columns across as to whether they are limited English proficient, disabled, and the like. Let's pretend, actually I'm going to go back, let's pretend that we noticed the first student there was the ethnicity should not be white. For whatever reason, the uh, registration packet it somehow got missed or something got entered wrong in the system and the student really should be African-American. Well, what would need to happen is someone would need to go back in the student management system, make that change. That data would need to be pulled from the student management system, loaded up to level zero, need to go up to level one without any errors, would be no, need to load it up to level two with no errors, and you would finally see it in this output report. So it is not as simple as just logging into level two and making some edits. It really, it goes, you have to go back to the source system to make sure the data is being corrected appropriately and then it needs to load through the levels. This is done on a weekly basis and I would recommend, at least for CINI RIC, I would recommend you reaching out to your local RIC to find out how data is loaded. I know there are RICs that load data on a month, more monthly basis and so on. So just make sure you're aware of that loading process because if you miss a deadline, you may not be able to load appropriately. 
So we have, within the SERS 313, we then have data pulls. And if you see on the bottom, there are enrollment snapshots, specifically when SERS and the, the reporting systems send the information over to Bruce in the state aid department. And so specifically, January, the data is pulled for the governor's executive budget. And those the student counts and the demographics, the, one, the student demographics that are used in the formulas, that information is sent over to Bruce and is used to produce the output reports and run the uh, foundation aid and all of the other uh, subcategories of aid. And so we have the 313.1. In December, the 313 and the 313.1 will be the same. It, as of January, when that data poll happens, the 313.1 is frozen. So that will reflect, if you were to drill into the 313.1 January, you would see the data that was reported to state aid on the date, the January date. In addition, in March, for the legislative budget, that data is re-pulled and sent over. So you would now be able to choose the 313.1 March. And then you have August. And August is the last data poll. This is the data, this is the information, these are the student counts that are finalized for state aid. There is no chance I just to wanna, correct. If, if I can jump in just one second, yeah. uh, the, the January poll, is used for the uh, legislative database update. The, the initial governor's budget uses the claim data that's submitted, estimated claim data, enrollment data on the state aid claim. The March file is used as a May database update, and then the end of the year is the final enrollment data that will be official and on SAMS for uh, current year and estimated in state aid calculations. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Bruce. So we have the different times during the year where we're reporting, and again, you can correct data, you can review the data throughout the year, and we send it up to the state aid department so that they can use it for their purposes. Again, the next report we have is the 314. And so for this particular one, this is Lansing. And so this would be Lansing's reporting of students attending their building. And we're reporting we have one student that's a Portland resident, but is attending Lansing School District. And again, these are students that are probably your staff members bringing them into your district with the, with the staff member to be educated. Again, these could be being charged tuition, do not necessarily have to be charged tuition. The next report we have is SERS 316, and this is for any pre-K program. It does not necessarily have to be the UPK grant program. There are districts that may have a district-funded pre-K program. They report these students, and so in the 313, they would be listed in the pre-K column, and then here we break out the different funding sources, half day or full day, and then how they're funded. So if you have a, a community-based organization that's working with you, you would have the different ways that these students are being educated and being funded. Depending on your district, some don't have pre-K, so they wouldn't have this report. And if I can jump in one more time again, Absolutely. sorry. It, it's, it's really critical that UPRE-K data be looked at early on, like in December, coming up this next month, because we'll, we'll begin to use that UPRE-K data for our February database when it's first pulled in January. And then a little further down the road, there's a file that's created to establish your next year maximum UPRE-K uh, grant application amounts. So it's a little bit more critical that UPRE-K data be reviewed and looked at up front so we can get those next year grant application uh, maximums correct. You do, districts do have until August to finalize their current year counts for the current year aid, but again, I, I ask that districts really 
try to do a 100% job early on uh, to set their U-Pre-K enrollment. Thank you. Excellent. So the next recording we have, um, as Angie said earlier, this is the third 319. This is not a report that the district is required to certify that it's accurate. It is informational, and so these are, this is for Lansing School District again, and so this would be for Lansing resident students who are attending a public or charter school elsewhere. So they live in Lansing and they're, we have nine students going to New Roots Charter School. And so this is information reported by the other public and charter school. Yeah, and so what the business official does in Lansing is take the nine students that I have listed here and compares it with her charter school bill. And we reconcile that and make sure that the data reporting from the charter school then lines up with the bill she receives. As you can see, we also have three students at George Junior Republic, and those students um, also the school business official receives uh, a bill for, and we identify those. Again, Ithaca has four of our students as well. So it's a good cross-check for us data coordinators to sit with the business officials and say, hey, just so you know, what bills are you receiving? Because we can start to line this up with the data in these reports. And so now, oops, wrong way. We have the drill down. So again, we have the detail, the summary page, and now we have the detail, and we can look at the listing and reconcile the bills from the charter school to the students that uh, we say are reporting to the uh, data warehouse. And so the next one is there's there's 323, and so this is the, the free and reduced. And so if there were reports that should be scrutinized, should be looked at, um, this would be one of them. And if you know the formulas, right now we're using the K6 should be the focus of your um, attention, where you would want K6 free and reduced numbers, and those are the students, FTEs, that are being used within the foundation aid formula. And again, we don't give you an example of the drill down, but there is a drill down where we could drill into and check the student count. And so we go into free and reduced. And so this page is very wordy. Um, it started in 1314 where Data Warehouse was actually the source for the free and reduce and not the institutional master file or the bed where you were able to hand write in your students who were free and reduce eligible. So again, this is a, a lot of detail. Um, there's a summary, the next page. And so we have students that are included in the SERS 323. So remember, they, these are the enrolled students on your 313 report that are eligible for free or reduced meals on that day. They include any carryover eligibilities for 30 operating days. We have a question for you. Yes. This is from Lisa. Uh, Lisa wants to know, we have many students that move from the public school and charter schools all year long. We are billing for partial FTEs from our charters. This will not match up with the SERS reports. I guess it's more of a statement. And that's correct, yes. All this will be as of Beds Day, but at least it gives you somewhere to start. Um, prior to this report, it was sort of haphazard reporting altogether. The charter schools didn't really want to share the names of the students, and the districts were being billed and couldn't confirm the districts actually attending. So while not perfect, is much better than what we've had. Okay, great. And we have a second question. This is from Karen. How is this report affected by a district using a community eligibility provision of child nutrition services? I'm assuming she's referring to the SERS 323. I don't know. Okay, I'm going to make they, that assumption. There's the question answer <laughs> uh, She says yes, actually. Okay, all right. I just wanted to make sure we were all talking about the same report. So that's a great question with the community eligibility option and. Realistically, the, the regs say that any student who has to be truly eligible, so while I understand the entire population of the building or the district can receive the community eligibility option, only the students who are eligible are re required to report. There's a, a, several pieces of documentation we can share out to Matthew and he can, he can send it out, but 
it's pretty clear that it is really only the eligible students. And eligible meaning they filled out an application, essentially, they came through on the Medicaid direct cert file, they, care, they were part of the carryover. So I know that can be really confusing and usually if it's so confusing, we default to the Child Nutrition Office for additional backup because community eligibility is not, it's um, kind of its own beast. And, and the SERS manual also has a page or two that goes into a little bit more detail as far as what you're supposed to report in SERS for free and reduced price lunch. Yep. So that, that's, a, that's a good uh, reference document as well. Yep. Yes, it is. So the students that would be on the SERS 23 include anyone who is enrolled on Beds Day and is either in the carryover population for the 30 operating days, comes in on the August Direct CERT file that's generated from the Department of Social Services. So these are families that have filed with the state for public service and the Department of Social Services makes available to the school district the information. So those families don't have to fill out an additional application. So it's really a way for the families to receive the benefit without another form to fill out. There's also students who are categorically eligible. They would include the homeless, your migrant, foster, or fit person. So you're going to have liaisons within the district for each of these different populations and you would then coordinate with them to confirm that these students are included in your free and reduced uh, uh, population. And then you have any students who might fill out a paper application prior to Beds Day and are approved for either free or reduced meals. And so there's additional considerations and the bottom two bullets in red are ones that we're working on and we include both these students and students who are eligible but do not participate in the free and reduced program in the district. So you may have a family who comes in on the direct cert file, they get the letter that says they're eligible for free, free or reduced meals, free meals in the district, and they send the letter back or notify the district in some way that says, we don't, it's great that we're eligible for it, but we don't want that benefit. Well, if the student comes in and needs to get a meal at school, they'll pay for it. And so those students uh, we're working with the different vendors, particularly for CINREC, um, but we're working with the vendors to make sure that we concentrate on those populations of students as well. So to, to clarify, both these students, just, just because these are in red, so unless you are reporting this data out of your student management system, which with all the privacy and security being sort of highlighted at the state level, most districts are not using their student management system to report this data. And the reason I'm saying that it, if you use your student management system, you have control over start and end dates, including students or not including students. Most districts are limited to the other food service vendors, NutriKids, WinSnap, so on and so forth throughout the state. Right now, none of those vendors that we are aware of have the ability to report both these students, nor do they have the ability to report students who are eligible but do not participate in FERPL. So we're sitting and we're having conversations with Bruce and Ellen Martin from SED to try to figure out how we can reach out to the, the vendors to make sure these students are included. This isn't just a vendor issue though, however, if you remember those BOCE students were on the SERS 312, which is the Beds Day Enrollment for State Aid. The SERS 313 is the, the entire list of thir SERS 323 free and reduced lunch report is based on the 313. So if they're on the 312 report, we have to do some uh, more discussion about how we're going to actually get those students included on that report and we've started having those discussions. So what do we do with all these SERS reports now that we've given you a million and one to actually look at? And why do you care about them? Well, most of you are familiar with what we call a three-year enrollment summary. And these reports come out in the portal, which it's the business portal I'm talking about. I've listed the link there if you're not familiar. In December, which is right around the corner here, you may have the ability to receive five reports. And I say may have because it depends on your district and what the district sort of demographic looks like. And depending on that, you may receive one report, you may receive five. 
So let's look at what one, just the sort of basic three-year enrollment summary means. What we've done for you is this three-year enrollment summary listed here takes what you see in SAMS and aligns it with the level two report in the middle column and goes back to description one, so to speak, on the left-hand side. So you have three columns of data. And for example, you might see, okay, SIRS grades one through three. Well, that, if you look at the next column over, is listed and comes from the SIRS 313, grade one, two, and three, which we showed you earlier. That lines up to the SAMS form A item two. And what happens here is, Bruce wanted me to make a note that data is imported into SAMS for data reporting and analysis purposes. So what happens is when this data is collected through Data Warehouse, there's a big giant extract that gets sent to Bruce. And then he works his magic, because I don't actually really know what he does. But he works his magic and he massages it in a way that then it ends up in SAMS. And this used to be a place where school districts could just type in all of their numbers. And now all districts are able to do our you're able to project in SAM. So projections are great, but once these data numbers come into SAM, the only way to correct them is to go back to the student management system or whatever system the data is coming from, so to speak. In this case, it is the student management system. Correct that data, have it flow up to level zero, level one, level two, and then ultimately into this three-year enrollment summary. Please note that the only data that can be fixed right now if you had any issues would be 15-16. There is no retroactive changes that can be made at this point that I'm aware of. So, I, I just want to mention also, if I yeah. could jump in a sec, in the SAM column that you have on the screen, the far right column, those yeah. are the reference lines. Each line in SAMs in the Form A, uh, there's three columns. The, the center column is the prior year's BEDS Day enrollment which has just been finalized and loaded into SAM. Districts can't change that. The far right-hand column of the Form A, let's say, for instance, Form A Entry 2 would be your Grades 1 through 3 enrollment. That's an open field that districts are putting in their current year, Beds Day, October 2015 estimate. And again, as uh, it was just uh, noted, we ask districts continue to update that projection right through into January because we do use that and compare it to the actual SERS data that we see coming in just to check and verify that the data we're getting from the IRS office is lining up with the estimates that the districts are reporting to, to kind of double check and make sure that the data is going to the right source items or to the right uh, data items. Thank you. All right, thanks, Bruce. Um, items one through 16 are listed on this first slide and then 16 through seven, or 27 on the next slide so that you can kind of see um, in relationship to SAMS and or um, if it's a foundation aid output report or if it's a universal pre-K grant output report or if it's handled in the Schedule U. So we just tried to create a crosswalk between data warehouse and school business so that when you talk to your data coordinator or whomever is overseeing this data reporting process, you can have a communal language to speak so that each one of you understands where the other one is coming from. And what does this look like from a school district perspective? So this is what you're actually going to find in the portal very shortly. And I'm using Lansing's data here. So you can see that this is old data because we don't have a new one out there just yet. So this is what they received last December. You'll see it's fall 14, fall 13, fall 12. And as you can sort of kind of see, if there's any large deviations, you probably want to take a look into that. If I notice that SERS grades 1 through 3, 274 compared to 258 the previous years, that's kind of a significant jump. I'm going to hopefully, I, I have a process in place that I, I know who each one of those 272 students are. So we can validate that, yeah, that is a jump, but yes, it is accurate. And I know I'm using a very simplistic example, but it does help when you get to some of the more, dis, the more difficult questions when you start to look at, you know, district residents or non-residents or students attending placements that you're not familiar with and you have to ask questions. 
Another three-year enrollment summary that you may or may not see is you might have resident students enrolled in charter schools on beds day. So as you can remember, or let me preface this by saying that these reports are in the portal as well, and you cannot drill down into these. These are just informational reports. Now, when I look at this report, if you remember, Lansing had nine students. We could drill down in our SERS 319 report that showed the charter school enrollment. So you can use this to compare with this informational report to look at those nine students. So we are sending nine students to New Roots Charter School. I have verified those nine with the business official and the billing to make that at least as up to date as we could as of business as bed day. Um, another report you may find resident students enrolled in non-public schools with tuition paid by, paid by parents or others as of bed today. As you can see, there's a number of different non-public schools listed, and when we look at the non-public school um, information with the business official, they can confirm or deny, yes, we are, yes, we're not. The one limitation to this is that we cannot drill down. So sometimes it involves several conversations with the non-pub about, hey, wait a second, how is it that I have four students at Covenant Love? I really only have record of three, and you know sometimes that becomes a, a larger question of is the student living in the district? Are they not? So on and so forth. All those fun questions that you get to sift through, but at least it gives you a starting point. Another report you may or may not receive: resident or non-resident pupils attending non-public schools in this district on Beds Day. So. Here you are, this, this example is Troy City School District, and within the district boundaries, we have those schools, the non-pubs listed, and within those non-pubs, the students are then listed there. Again, you cannot drill down, however, it gives you a starting point. Last but not least, you may or may not have residents and non-resident pupils attending charter schools in this district. So, for this particular, for Troy City School District, they actually have a uh, their own charter school, if you will. It's called True North Troy Prep Charter School within its part of the district, and then you can see the count of students attending both K6 and then 712. We're going to end the presentation today with a timeline. We've given you a lot of information, and I know it's, it's probably a lot to digest. But if there's anything that you can kind of take away, um, the timeline is probably most important because I think several times throughout this webinar we've spoke about just how long it can take sometimes for data to get corrected, to be loaded through the different levels, and then to actually see it on a level two output report. So just be aware. So we have our first snapshot coming up in January. That date I believe is going to be January 8th, and we're going to it's, while it's not a certification, it is a pull and extract of data, grade by grade enrollment, UPK, and as Bruce outlined prior or earlier in the conversation, really UPK should be looked at now um, as December rolls around. They will be taking their own extracts and using that. Supplemental district enrollment, resident, inner district, incarcerated youth, home or hospital. So it's really looking at all of those BEDS reports, the Charter School District of Attendance or Residence, Free and Reduced Lunch. So really, when you think about a process, I like to do all my work up front. So from September, well really October through January, we are doing all we can do to make sure that those BEDS reports are as accurate as possible. And then as you continue on, you'll see that in the red, the end of March, we have snap, Snapshot 2, and the same enrollment counts as Snapshot 1 get taken, the free and reduced lunch is used again, and that's sent to state aid, and districts have to verify that data. So hopefully when you compare January to March, there isn't too many, there, aren't, there wouldn't be too many changes, because remember, all of this data is, is as of beds day. So if a student comes or goes, changes free or reduced lunch after beds, it's not going to be accounted for. It really is what happens on Beds Day or as of Beds Day. Lastly, you still get a chance to make sure everything's right. August is the end of the year snapshot. SERS is locked down and data can no longer be changed. Uh, many, many, many times at the end of the year, 
there are districts changing data right up to the very last minute, and sometimes that doesn't always work out. So I would strongly encourage districts to have a process in place, have your data coordinator reaching out to all the different liaisons. We reported we report data from many departments within each district, so it's really, really important to have those open lines of communication. It used to be a very small world we lived in in data warehouse uh, impacting maybe one or two offices, and now it feels as though we are in just about every office. I think transportation might be the only one we haven't hit yet, but just give it time. I'm sure at some point we will need to collect some type of data. With that, we're going to end the presentation. Are there any questions? As people are thinking about questions, I just want to make a, a comment outside of the uh, webinar. Uh, we have the state aid office has made official within the state aid management system selected 2015-16 state aid output reports. We'll be doing a web posting soon to announce that to the world. They're only official in SAM, so you need to be logged in as a user to see them. They will not be made official and public for a few more weeks uh, until we're uh, absolutely 110% sure uh, of what we're pushing out to the, to the field. But um, they're out there, and we ask that anybody listening in take a look at them if you're a SAMS user and uh, check your state aid calculations. If you see anything that looks uh, odd or you have any questions, please call our office. Okay, any other questions uh, for our presenters today? I do not have any questions queued up. Okay, all right, well then I'm going to close our session. I want to thank you all uh, for uh, this uh, very informative presentation and uh, for fitting it all into uh, a short time period. So Angie Russell, Tina Boots, and Bruce Jaliolowski, thank you and um, uh, uh, have a great day, everybody. <laughs>